Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll visit the old Patagonian Express, which still chugs along the base of the Andes Mountains in Argentina. Plus, meet a man whose layout ideas come directly from his own railroad history and relive the life of one of the most well-known rail photographers of our times. But first, let's step back in time as we take a rail journey along the scenic Oregon coast. Let's get started. Completed in 1912, the Tillamook branch of the Southern Pacific Railroad hauled timber and tourists from the Portland, Oregon area to and from the coast. The line had several owners and continued operation up into the 1950s. In 2007, a tropical storm caused extensive damage and the railroad was closed. But that wasn't the end of the line. Local businessman Scott Wickard had a vision while working at the Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad. He would preserve the history of Pacific Northwest railroading. We uh, saw how much fun it was up in Washington State operating steam trains and uh, we had some different ideas on how we could do things better and uh, we wanted to give it a shot. In 2000, Scott acquired the Curtis Lumber Company No. 2 and brought it to the port of Tillamook, Oregon. The Heisler was owned by uh, Jack Anderson, uh, who I worked for at Mount Rainier Scenic Railroad, and we had a chance to acquire it from him. And we moved it from its location, which was Ashford, Washington, up to Mount Rainier Scenic, and we restored it in our spare time up there. And it took us about a year to do the boiler work on it. Today, the Oregon coast uses a rod-type locomotive. Uh, we have our, our steam locomotive, the McLeod 25. Uh, that is a 262 built for uh, the McLeod River Railroad of McLeod, California in 1925 and uh, served for them for almost 87 years. Uh, they used it in log service and occasional excursion service. In addition to historic locomotives, the railroad also has a preserved fleet of rolling stock. We have uh, our regular excursion cars, they're open cars and uh, so people generally like to sit on those on our nice days. Uh, we also have a 1924 Southern Pacific Pullman commuter coach. It uh, was used by them in commuter service between San Francisco and San Jose. We brought that up here in 2008. It was restored over a three-year period by our dedicated volunteers. Uh, we also have the newest uh, piece of rolling stock, a 1963 caboose built for the Rock Island. That's our portable ticket office, so that goes with the train. We also have a baggage car, a converted baggage car, started at life as a heavyweight and is a smooth-sided, uh, streamlined car. While steam brings in the tourists, the Oregon coast hasn't forgotten diesel power. We also have our uh, General Motors uh, EMD F7, and uh, that was built in 1953 for the Great Northern Railroad, the Empire Builder and spent some time under, under Burlington Northern as well as uh, P Puget Sound and Pacific. The GP9 uh, was built for Chesapeake and Ohio uh, and uh, worked for them for a number of years. It was bought by the Port of Tillamook Bay in uh, 1990 for their railroad out here and uh, we acquired it just a few years ago and we generally use it on our dinner trains. The uh, RDCs started out working for the Susquehanna, then they were uh, acquired by the Port of Tillamook Bay uh, in the early 90s and used for their excursion service out here, and uh, we use them courtesy of the port. But it is the experience that most people come here to see. Basically, uh, the majority of our excursion trains operate between Garibaldi and uh, Rockaway Beach. We offer a variety of, um, of environments to see as we go along the coast. Um, we start on Tillamook Bay. You can look across the bay and look over at Bay Ocean Spit. Um, we go uh, along a lake called Smith Lake and then we come into Rockaway which is basically uh, your parallel with the ocean. You get a nice view of the ocean, some other small lakes along the way. It's, a, it's an authentic uh, historical railroad experience as people would have experienced back in the day. Our passenger coach is very similar to what it would have appeared as built our steam locomotives, we try and keep them close to as built as possible. And generally, we like to give people the historic holiday experience that's associated with this railroad that people enjoyed at the turn of the century. Last year, we had 13,000 riders. This year, we have 18,000. And uh, our ridership uh, continues to improve year by year. And what does the future hold for the Oregon Coast Railroad? 
we would eventually like to be able to expand service south to Tillamook and uh, also uh, be able to offer more excursions on the northern half of our line uh, above Wheeler. Um, we've leased the trackage from the Port of Tillamook Bay. Uh, we've done a lot of work to clear back the brush and uh, that's been encroaching on the right of way. Scott Wicker did indeed have a vision and in fulfilling his dream, he has made it possible for people of all ages to experience the history of railroading. The trip offers riders not only gorgeous views of the coast and forests, it also offers a glimpse back in time. Coming up, we visit a museum that is dedicated to one of the premier railroad photographers of the 20th century. But first, let's meet a man who's not only a model railroader, but whose background is grounded in the real thing. For 15 years, 14 as an engineer, David Downton worked for CSX, mostly operating hot intermodal trains between Willard, Ohio, and Chicago. David is retired now, but his passion for all things railroading is still going strong. I worked out of uh, CSX's terminal in Willard, Ohio, and that's an old B&O crew change point, and what we would do is we would pick up trains that were coming in online from Buffalo or coming in from the Baltimore area and then take them on to one of several yards in Chicago that specifically handle intermodal traffic. David always liked railroad signaling equipment. And while working for CSX, he had a remarkable opportunity. I had started collecting real railroad equipment back in the early 90s. And then when I hired on the railroad in 1997, uh, they were removing the, what was the Baltimore, Ohio railroad system signal uh, arrangement called the color position lights and putting in new signals on the way to Chicago. So I secured permission from the company after 13 months to get some of this old equipment. And uh, working through the police officer, uh, CSX police officer in Willard, I was able to go out and, uh, and pick up the material. Some of the equipment was very old and required a bit of TLC. A lot of it uh, needed to be completely reconditioned because it was the end of its working life but I was fortunate enough to get it and with all the electronics and even some of the wiring that went with it and to uh, put it back together again. The uh, oldest thing that I have really is a uh, position light signal, a Pennsylvania Railroad style position light signal. And on that case, it has like 1916, 1917 on it. So it's probably one of the rarer pieces and it has its dwarf, which is a signal that, small signal to use to get out of sidings and in yards with it. In fact, most of the things I have have both signal configurations, a mass signal and a dwarf. So it's possibly the rarest. David was also interested in trains from his childhood. And like most men growing up in the 1950s, had a Lionel. He kept his trains, and once he got married, the encouragement for a layout came from an unusual source. The layout started um, when my wife and I were married. I uh, ended up getting the train that uh, I had been given as a child. My father bought it when I was about three. That tells you who was really playing with the train for a while. And so uh, we ended up picking it up. And my wife saw this little old Lionel with 16 pieces of rusted track. And she said, you should get some more track for this. And so when we ended up getting more track. She said, uh, it looks lonely. You should buy another train. Well, it isn't lonely anymore out there. One of the reasons we purchased the house was because of all the space down here. It's a ranch and it has a, a large basement. The basement's approximately 60 feet long. The layout's about 52 feet long. At its widest point, it's about 20 feet wide, but it narrows back and forth depending on uh, you know, the space that's available. The form itself is an inverted question mark. It was a progress in works for about seven years and uh, has 1,100 pounds of plaster in it, about 13,000 trees and several miles of wire Dave has a very special area from which to watch his trains run. I wanted him a place where I could sit and run the trains and also duplicate what a real railroad station or control point, either a town or a small uh, control point, uh, looked like in the 50s. And so this room sort of recreates that with the telegraph keys, the old scissored phone, the speakers, and uh, even the kerosene lamps as an auxiliary in case the power went out. I can look out the window and I see that tunnel behind me and I see the trains going down through the valley and that sort of emulates what I saw uh, you know, down in that home area. You would figure that Dave would try to incorporate his signals into the layout. General Railway Signal, when they put their transformers out for the BNO signal, signal system Chicago, they had 300 watt transformers and a tap on there that was approximately 15 volts. 
And so uh, that's what I've wired in my system. So I have seven general railway signal transformers that run the power for the layout and then a number of additional transformers around the edges that run the real signals or other lighting. Dave's wife, Dorothy, also has a role in the railroad. When we first saw this basement, Dave took me aside and said, this would be ideal for my train layout. Would you mind if I use this basement for my train layout? And I said, no, you do whatever you wish, as long as I do not have to clean it or dust it. And that has worked to this day. I do neither clean or dust. And he takes care of the whole basement, which is fine with me. Our thanks to David and Dorothy Downton for sharing their passion of both real and model railroading. Considered by many to be one of the premier railroad photographers of the 20th century, O. Winston Link specialized in nighttime photography. He is best known for his photographs and sound recordings, which chronicled the last day of steam on the Norfolk and Western Railroad. O. Winston Link died in 2001, but his photographic legacy lives on at the O. Winston Link Museum in Roanoke, Virginia. The museum knew that Link's photographs were about more than trains. They told the story of life in the 1950s in the hills and hollows of coal mining country. When the museum was originally um, constructed, the originizing curators decided to separate the museum in two main ways. Um, the first way being by division of railroad uh, for the Norfolk and Western Railway, and the second division of the museum where we talk about each individual portion of the railroad. West Roanoke Gallery focuses on Winston's sound recordings as well as his formative work and the beginning of the Norfolk and Western project. Heritage Gallery is a recreation of the Vesuvius General Store. Um, everything that you see within the Heritage Gallery, as far as furnishings are concerned, are original to the photograph that you'll see hosted within that space. And it really tries to pull an intense connection and show how much these people depended upon the railroad for their daily lives. What did Winston feel were the essential elements to feature in his photos? He wanted to uh, show what was work that was being done along the railroad as a passenger slept. And he wanted a, an employee of the NW in each of his photographs. He was interested in the people. He talked to them, he listened to them. And uh, you know, and of course, he was from Brooklyn, New York. So of course, coming to this rural area of Virginia, he was fascinated by the way they talked, and they were fascinated with him, you know. Usually, I try to get the local people in it, and that's what I did. And that's why a lot of the pictures are so interesting, because you have good faces, beautiful faces. You know, there was no end to that kind of a supply, and I always try to work them in and make the trains sort of in the background where you, sometimes you, don't, you hardly notice it so far away. Night photography had its challenges. The technical challenges facing Link at the time of the Norfolk and Western project really do revolve directly around the technology available to photographers at that time. You know, every time you see an O. Winston Link photograph, 99% any light source that you see is a mercury flash bulb. So, you know, each flash bulb has one use, so one shot and then you're done. Link's work was not limited to black and white material. The Radford Gallery focuses on Winston's color photography. He said, uh, the train is black, smoke is white, uh, the tracks are black, night is black. What do I need with color? Then he went to the Abington branch and discovered these beautiful gold trees, green grass, contrasting with the corn shocks. And he said, I have to have color. Winston also made sound recordings of the trains that he photographed. Ellen Arnold recalls one from Christmas Eve. The sequence of about 10 minutes uh, on one of his recordings was when uh, you could hear the, the chimes uh, from the church playing Christmas carols. And you begin to hear the, the train whistle from way back. And then it, the sound overpowers the, uh, the church chimes. Winston had a list of favorite photographs. 
he had a top 40. Uh, the drive-in, for instance, the uh, gas pump were favorite ones, that, uh, not only of his, but of people as well. And the station at Green Cove was uh, a, a very popular thing. I think his favorite one was of the Luray Crossing with the Watchman's Tower, the gates, uh, and then of course the train came chugging by. And uh, so he, he said, that picture has everything in it. My favorite railroad was the Norfolk and Western. Because of the terrain that it went through, it was the type of locomotives they had, and the management was so cooperative everywhere it went. Every, everybody was, was helpful, from the president down to the track walkers. No matter who I asked for help or assistance, they gave it willingly and without any problems. I was never refused. So that's just become, of course, a, my favorite. Although all railroads are my favorite because I just love railroads. But the Norfolk and Western was special. While the photos of O. Winston Link may appear to some to be just about railroads, in fact, they are much, much more. Instead, they are a chronicle of history and a glimpse into a time gone by. Hi, I'm Dave Ball. One of the best parts of my job as originating producer for Tracks Ahead was, well, to be honest, the travel. We've been to some amazing places. One of my absolute favorite journeys was to visit the La Trochita, quite a rare and narrow gauge train set along the base of the Andes Mountains in Argentina. This adventure took us through the vast expanses of Patagonia and all the way down to Tierra del Fuego, literally the land's end. Enjoy. Off in the distance, a lone narrow gauge steam engine is the only sign of life. It's certainly not what most people envision when they think of Argentina. But this is the Argentina of diesel and steam engines that chug through the vast expanses of Patagonia. The La Trochita, a truly rare narrow gauge train. And finally, El Tren del Fin del Mundo, or the train at the end of the world. We start in the town of Bariloche, in the foothills of the Andes, and a gateway to the Patagonian region. Nestled between two lakes and surrounded by a national park, the scenic town is known for its skiing during the summer months of July and August. Here we board the broad gauge Tren Patagonico pulled by diesel engine for the 122 mile trip to Yakubachi. We wind through rugged countryside and high desert. The arid territory has few trees and even fewer people. What you do see here are huge ranches that raise sheep, cattle, and horses. As you look out the window, there's absolutely nothing. It's just pure landscape. And once in a while you see wild animals, and once in a while you see uh, sheep and cattle. Throughout the trip, the tour we're on offers frequent stops for photo ops. Of particular interest are bridge crossings and the junction where the broad gauge joins the narrow gauge for a few miles before our next stop, Yakobachi. The small town of Yakobachi, named for an Italian engineer who helped build the line, is the northern terminal of the famous Escal line. Here we board La Trochita, our narrow gauge steam engine. In the 1920s, uh, the government of Argentina embarked on a very uh, extensive uh, program of uh, building railways in the Patagonian region. The idea was to literally build thousands of kilometers or miles of track uh, throughout this desert region in the south and uh, to link it together with the already existing private railways in the Pampa region to the north. In uh, the early 20s, they delivered a very, very sizable number of locomotives and cars and huge amounts of rail. And despite this uh, rather uh, elaborate plan, they actually only built a very small part of it. This train, which was built to haul sheep and wool, now caters to the tourist trade. And the people who find their way onto these coaches are often die-hard rail fans and photographers from all over the world. Hey, I'm from uh, New Zealand, and uh, we're sort of just semi-retired now. We're doing our last fling of the steam engines around the world. You know, it reminds me of the train in France as a child. This is what we had. When we traveled through France, this is what we had to put up with. So. I'm afraid, I'm, I kind of am afraid a little bit that, uh, unfortunately, maybe Argentina will not be able to keep this program. We have got rid of all the uh, 
uh, steam locomotive in France, there's only a few left, and they've become private. So it's something that harkens back to kind of Nevada at the turn of the 19th, or the 19th 20th century. Um, it's just like narrow gauge. It's the, the closest thing you can get to that. It's the, the wide open, there's nothing there. It's just uh, absolutely barren with this one little teeny train running through it. It's, it's wonderful. It's the closest thing you'll ever get to being in the 19th century. Throughout the trip, the snow-peaked Andes are always glistening in the background. Small towns are few and far between, but even the hearts of the most jaded rail travelers melt at the sight of local children smiling and waving as the train passes. The staff and crew are among the most dedicated in the world. No, I will never get tired of running a steam engine. For me, it's an honor. I'm very proud of being up there. And as far as I can go, I will go in this life. Back at Bariloche, we take a short excursion aboard El Historico Tren for a 38-mile jaunt to Perito Marino. The engine and restored wooden cars, all built in 1912 in Scotland, are well maintained by a preservation society. Unlike La Trochita, this train is appointed with luxurious details rivaling the Orient Express. A major highlight of our trip is a side trip to the Perito Moreno Glacier, one of the fastest moving glaciers in the world. Our next side trip includes Torres del Pines, a famous national park of valleys, glaciers, and mountains. With all this unspoiled beauty, one could almost envy the life of the Guanacos and the Rias that call this place home. We have just one more memorable destination before we head home. Just outside Ushuaia, the most southern city in the world, El Tren del Fin del Mundo, or Train at the End of the World. In this country of extremes, here's one more. This is the most southern railroad on the planet. The railroad was originally built as a prison railway to haul prisoners to and from um, a detention uh, area to take them out, I believe, probably to logging operations where the prisoners were put to work. And uh, it was abandoned many years ago, but with the sudden growth in the tourist traffic, and that tourist traffic depends heavily on the steamship business, on cruise ships, uh, investors uh, came to the area and rebuilt the railway. And the railway is very, very uh, interesting because, well, first of all, the gauge is only 500 millimeters, which is about 20 inches. So it's a, a true narrow gauge line. But the thing that attracts a lot of people who don't go there simply for tourism is the fact that the railway has two very unusual locomotives. Actually, it has three steam locomotives, and two of those are Garrett-type locomotives, which are articulated locomotives of British design and uh, the boiler is suspended between the forward section, uh, driving section, and the rear driving section. But these are little tiny things. They're 040 plus 040 Garrett's. And uh, I must say that's a, a, a rarity. Uh, I only can think of a couple other examples in the world, at least that I've seen in my many years of traveling around and looking at railways. This is one of the most spectacular physical regions in the world. You've got the Andes to the west, you've got this high desert to the east, you've got uh, amazing wildlife, you can see, uh, of course, uh, snow-capped peaks, and then, of course, you have these railroads that bring us here in the first place. Put them all together, and it's one of the most wonderful places in the world to see and to photograph and to ride trains. La Trochita is just one of the remote and truly outstanding lines our crew has visited over the years. Dave has selected each classic track story to really highlight the links that Tracks Ahead has gone for years to bring you train stories you just don't get anywhere else. Well, that's all for this episode. Please join us next time for more Tracks Ahead.